Tim had just started his second year as an apprentice electrician and the electrical contractor that Tim worked for had a job to service um, signs for a, a fast food outlet and for this particular task they were starting in Brisbane travelling all the way through Queensland. I think that there was a lot of expectation on a very young set of shoulders. He just tried to do the right thing and tried to earn the respect of the employer so he, he could be called a good employee. I do remember the morning that I last saw him. I remember his bag, I remember his jacket, I remember the way he looked and just remember saying goodbye and I never realised that was the last time I was going to see him in any way at all that I could recognise my son. The day it all turned pear shape was the 14th of August. It was the last job on this run that the boys had been doing from Brisbane through to Cairns. The work that Tim was doing was very much electrical work. They were exchanging the light bulbs, they were changing the ballast, they had to check all the wiring and stuff inside. Working inside the signs was not live work because they could unplug it. So that created a, a level of protection there. They had a bit of trouble trying to find a position to park the elevated work platform on the day. When I look back at where it was, I, I couldn't think of a worse place to park it. The supervisor put it directly under the high voltage power lines. They'd worked for a while, had morning tea, and it was the first task after morning tea. The supervisor was doing some other work and he put Tim into the elevated work platform and Tim had large aluminium rods in the bucket that he must have been taking back up to reinstall in the sign. When the bucket got up high enough, he wasn't being watched, so he didn't have a spotter to keep an eye on him. He's almost gone straight up, and the metal that he had in the bucket with him has gone well into the exclusion zones and either contacted the line or gone very close to it so that it's arced over. Yeah. He got the full force of all that power all over him and right through him. They were able to actually manually lower the EWP from the ground when they got it down. It was just basically a, a charred body. It was just a devastating scene. It was a bit like a trauma zone. There was burnt equipment, burnt clothing. I remember they gave us back his safety boots. Even that were burned. The ambulance that picked him up from the accident scene took him to the Cairns Base Hospital and he was taken in, into intensive care. And just to see Tim there, I, I didn't even recognise it was my own son. I just hope and pray no other poor parent has to walk in and find what I found that day. My beautiful boy was not a beautiful boy. He was devastated. Burns are such an awful, awful injury to suffer. I just, I didn't know what to do. About day seven or day eight, the doctor came in and said, if he stays here, he will die. If he has any chance of living, it's a matter of getting him onto a flying doctor flight and getting him to Brisbane. And they put him on a plane. There was nowhere to be able to hug or touch. The only part that wasn't burnt was the top of his head. And I remember patting the top of his head, thinking, this is probably the last time I'll see you alive, mate. He was in absolutely atrocious condition. I, I, he was close to death. He was burnt over a considerable amount of his body and he'd had a deep passage of current in a few places as well. Um, and uh, so it makes it pretty horrible. Tim never really regained consciousness, what you could call consciousness. Tim underwent a series of major surgeries. So much of my memory of Tim is that month. I was just seeing him burned and devastated. I, I just can't seem to shake it. I want to remember him when he learned to ride his bike the first time. I want to remember him when he was first riding a motorbike or driving a car. And my memory is not that. My memory is that month. And it is so hard. And it happened in 1999. And I still have it with me. The 
time I just couldn't come to terms with it myself. I was thinking he'll be right, he'll come home, he'll come home and and when you get a phone call at midnight, it's never a good thing. And we answered it and they just said, just come now, just come. We sprinted to the hospital and pulled up out the front and jumped out and ran up the emergency ward. And he was my beautiful boy. My 17 year old son, my firstborn, the pride of my life. I couldn't comprehend it. At the time of Tim's death, he was 17 and four months old. Didn't get to 18. We'll never get to 18. Tim's death was so easily avoidable. In my opinion, why this occurred is that the risks weren't managed properly. In this case, I believe there was a, a number of things that went wrong. The bottom line is that the vehicle should have been parked and positioned in such a way as that they couldn't come within those exclusion zones. Or if there was no way that they could do that safely, that they should have stopped the job and um, you know, negotiated how to do it better or got in contact with the boss. He was under the age of 18. He shouldn't have been operating it. And if he was going to operate it, he should have been under really close supervision. The safety observer slash supervisor was on the ground doing some other work and, and wasn't actually looking at the time. If you need a safety observer, that's a full-time job. The bucket that Tim was standing in wasn't even insulated. So uninsulated EWP, not wearing enough protective clothing to stop from the flash burns, not having supervision, they are some really basic things. And then dealing with a young person. It's just a, a fact of life that when people are young, they, they don't believe anything can ever happen to them. They're, they're bulletproof. You're not, you know, I could walk you outside and show you, you know, 20 or 30 people right now who, same age, same gender, and they're certainly not bulletproof. You just can't be too careful. If it gets you, you're dead or you're devastated. You're wrecked. With younger people, sometimes when apprentices are fresh out of school, they're not as confident as older apprentices and they won't speak up. They'll just do what they're told. It's really important to speak up because you're messing with your life as well as everyone around you. Make sure all the apprentices know that it's OK to speak up and that you won't sound like an idiot for speaking up if you feel unsafe. Definitely instill into them the importance of, of communication, uh, confidence. If you get that gut feeling that, hey, oh, this isn't right, or oh, I'm not sure about this, if you're not 100% about doing anything, uh, then best just to ask someone else. I think about everyone else in the workplace and how to be safe for everyone, not just myself. It's all a team effort, it's not just Everybody looking after the apprentice. The apprentice has got to look after himself, other apprentices, other team members. It's watching each other's back. We've got the buddy system in place, so that way if someone does get hurt, there's another person there. Younger workers, they don't have the life experience. Generally, if you've got an apprentice who lacks experience um, and maturity, they're going to take shortcuts, going to be less aware of hazards and the risks involved, and more likely prone to, to get injured. Manage those hazards well before the 17 year olds have to make a decision that they may not be well equipped for. And that's where supervision definitely plays a big part. A key message from me, for what it's worth, is a young apprentice can never assume that they know what they're doing. So to always relay information back to the tradesman, what they believe they've got to do and what's expected. I've been in safety for a very long period of time and often get told the story that sometimes the safety steps that people want to put in place are too hard. It takes too much work. I can tell you a much harder job I had, and that was trying to work out what to put on Tim's headstone.